I've had the benefit of knowing Sarah and Scott for quite a few years now. I think we met possibly in 2007 or thereabouts, might have been 2007, 2008, when I worked for Reuters. Um, and I would just went down to do a piece about the year in viral videos. And I, and I met these two really impressive entrepreneurs. Uh, and you know, we kept in touch, and over the years, I've had the chance to see Unruly grow. Uh, and Unruly actually inspired this speaking s series in some ways, because I went to a uh, city Unruly University event uh, where I got to know Cass Business School. So it's a real pleasure to have both of you here. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to talk about you know, 2006. You start up a business. Is it, it was initially at the Truman Brewery, right? What, what was the, the vision back then? Because we know what you've become, but what, what did you set out to do? Uh, we knew that we would need to try a few things. We just knew we wanted to set up a business in the media space. Um, also true, though, um, Everything that we did back in the early days, back in early 2006, you can kind of see the seeds of what we've done subsequently. So everything that we did, everything that we tried out was around video and around social. So the very, very first thing that we did was create the site called the Viral Video Chart, which was, um, I mean, basically a, a, a big data idea. We were just sucking in lots of data from the social web in order to figure out what videos were um, trending. Uh, and that kind of interest in data and also the interest in consumer behavior underpins a lot of the product set that we have now. Did you think that would be a product that could take you places? I mean, because you've built, I know subsequently I, I've interviewed you, I don't know, maybe 2008 or thereabouts, and you're like, okay, the viral video is cool, but we actually make our money over here. Did you think at that time, did you know that you had a bigger play or what? How did that work out? Well, um, S Scott was always very ambitious um, for the company, and we all were. And although we didn't know exactly what we wanted to do, we were, we were really excited about building a big business. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've always wanted to have as much impact as possible. Uh, and something that, that we learned quite early on, or I learned quite early on, is that um, running a small business is really stressful. It doesn't matter how big your business is, it's really stressful because you're responsible for everything that happens and your destiny is in your own hands. And if it's just you or if it's you and 160 people, it's similarly stressful. So we knew we wanted to be big. We knew we needed a big plan to do that. We knew we had a limited runway. Um, so Viral Video Chart was great, but we could see it wasn't going to be a fantastic business model. Uh, so what we could see pretty much on day one was there was huge appetite from brands and agencies to use video to connect with consumers. So we didn't quite know what the opportunity was going to be, but we could see that there was about to be a big shift in the whole kind of marketing paradigm. Uh, and we were going to be moving from TV uh, to digital, and there was going to be a whole new type of content being created. But when people talk about pivots, you know, that, that's this jargon or that, that me talks about like, you know, seeing that one model is not necessarily going to work out or become like the thing to sustain you, so you, you turn uh, and you, you create something else. You actually created something amazing that's, that's fueled your later success. So how did, how did that come about? I mean, what was the eureka moment that inspired that? Um, so I, I guess with the viral video chart, so I mean, we started out thinking, let's have a media play. So built a website, got quite a decent audience to it. And then, you know, like a lot of people in the media business, you kind of follow the money, basically. Mm -hmm. So in trying to monetize that particular website, we figured out, you know, what did work and what didn't work. So running Google AdWords ads or, you know, affiliate links from Amazon didn't work particularly well. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you know, even very, very early on, we started to get inbound interest from, uh, brands and from ad agencies. So even when we just had four people and like one phone, you know, we'd actually get, I guess this dates us now, we used to get phone calls. <laughs> um, you know, we'd get inbound interest about people wanting to launch their video campaigns. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, very early. This is kind of two th 2006, 2007. This has become a really big industry now and it wasn't a big industry at the time. 
So we, 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 we actually tracked ARPU, so like, um, you know, average and revenue per user, I was get um, quite closely from the beginning. So we knew yeah. how many users we had. Right. We knew what our absolute amount of money coming in was. It wasn't very much. It might have been a few hundred quid or it might have been a few thousand pounds. That's what we're tracking very closely. And the video advertising thing really worked. Uh, but at a certain point, our audience stopped scaling. Mm -hmm. um, we, de we never got beyond about, I think, two million uniques. So we kind of went, oh, okay, right. well, there's other websites similar to this one with the same type of content with the same kind of problem from a monetization standpoint. Yeah. So that's when we you know, started launching as a platform <coughs> and then providing uh, monetization, not just to our own site, but to, to other, other people's websites as well. So, so what is it that you guys created that wasn't available elsewhere? Because you know, my, my background before Reuters is you know, I covered tech for I don't know, 15 years, going down to um, Madison Avenue talking to people about uh, Nielsen Media Research. There was a time where you know, all sort of ad uh, rates were, were based on little booklets that people would fill out, at least in the States, maybe not here, but uh, saying what they watched the previous night. And it was all a little bit of a fudge, but every, there was nothing better. So that's what, what, uh, that's what informed the, the ad rates. Whereas in the world of online, you know what people are clicking on. You know what's successful. So you obviously created something that had value. What was, what was that thing that, that other people couldn't figure out? So there were two things. There was the data, uh, which was the sharing data. So we have the largest database of uh, video sharing behavior that exists. And yeah. um, we've been able to use that to build out expertise. So even right in the early days, brands would come to us and say, what kind of content is working? You know, what is the mood? What are people sharing right now? What would work for our brand? Uh, and then the other thing that was different was scale. So because we were the first in the space, we were very quick to be able to scale our video platform. So we, within months, we had hundreds of publishers within a few more months, thousands of publishers, uh, and our audience reach now is 1.27 billion. So we can reach 1.27 billion connected consumers globally every month. So speed and scale are something that we've that we've always had, and sh shareability and portability of the player was the other thing. And it's partly about paying bloggers or or bloggers being able to benefit from videos that are seated on their site. Exactly. So it's paid media. So this is brands instead of paying a TV channel to run to run an ad. Um, brands will pay unruly uh, and then we'll distribute the ad um, across uh, the open web to lots of publishers and bloggers and they take a share of that. And, and how did you, I mean, I guess I'm going to move on to your entrepreneurial story in a little bit, but I want to understand the product because I remember a few, a few years ago uh, meeting someone from the Daily Mash through, through you uh, who are one of your bloggers. And at the time, I didn't, uh, it's now one of my favorite sites, but at the time I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, but that, that was bold for the time. That was something that I don't think was being done elsewhere, was it? To, to, to seed videos in that way, to think of an alternate way of, of, of I don't know, generating? We uh, were, I mean, we were, we were really quite early yeah. and it was really nice for sites like the Daily Mash yeah. because just as for, us, for our own site, it created, you know, an additional and really valuable income stream for them. You know, if you, you know, the only way that you can fund, you know, journalism or creating content, uh, really online is is through advertising. Mm -hmm. So, being able to make that work for, you know, what at the time we're we talking about bloggers here, because that's because we're talking about the period that was back kind of back in 2006, 2007. If you kind of fast forward to now, a lot of our work will be without developers say, but it's the same general principle. If you if you're writing a blog, you're creating content, you're making a game. Somehow you need to, to you know, if you, if you want to keep doing that, you need money coming in, you need to keep the lights on. Right. Uh, and advertising is a great way of doing that. And video advertising in particular has turned out to be a very effective way of doing that online. And that's, you know, now we're working with, um, you know, we work with, with Hearst, with IDG, with IPC, as, as well as all these, you know, kind of, you know, uh, SME um, publishing businesses too, for exactly the same reason. You know, we provide a, a you know, really good additional revenue stream to them. And, and you still have the viral video chart, but that's not a real focus. I mean, what, why do you, ha is that an important part of your business these days? The, well, do you want to see, I mean, the data yes. underlying it yeah, is fantastically important. Absolutely. So the data that we've been collecting since 2006 um, is, uh, is now being used to power one of our new products called ShareRank. Uh, this is a product we launched in 2012, uh, and what we do is we predict virality of videos before they launch. 
Uh, so brand will come to us with a video uh, and we'll... Which is kind of like the holy grail of it's advertising, the, It is, right? it is. Um, and it's something that everyone said could never be done. And for years, people have been telling us that you just can't do this, it's impossible. It's a black swan event. It's, it's like a bolt of lightning, you never know. And we're like, oh, well, okay, well, that's a problem that's worth solving, isn't it? If it's that impossible, it's what advertisers want. Uh, so we launched that in 2013, 2013 uh, using data that we've been collecting from the viral video chart, which is then built into Unruly Analytics. Um, and we've just recently launched, we have, global version, we have a global algorithm, we have local algorithms, uh, and we just launched a few weeks ago the movie trailer algorithm. Yes. Yeah. I think so we're, 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 I mean, we're quite unusual for a company in the you know, media or advertising space. People talk about advertising technology like it's rocket science and it generally isn't. A lot of the software, a lot of the technology that's around is honestly fairly trivial. It's just user interfaces performing quite simple tasks. We are quite unusual because I think both Sarah and I have quite a big academic bent and we've always, you know, as a company we've been very, very focused on data and insight and learning which is why when um, university um, academics started coming to us and asking for access to this data so they could start looking at uh, what makes content shareable online. Mm -hmm. We were really, really interested in collaborating with them. And it's that kind of you know, collaborative research with people outside of the building that's enabled us to take, you know, to then commercialize that research mm -hmm. and take it out to market uh, in a product like uh, ShareRank that Sarah just mentioned. Uh, Caroline uh, and Cass being a fantastic example. So for the first academic to come to us, uh, the first academic to ever show an interest in our data set and to realise that there was a big shift in marketing taking place um, was Caroline. Um, so yes, yeah, some of the very early papers that you were working on um, are using un unruly data. So you've been as successful, I think, and I, I don't want to jinx anyone, but as, as really any of the, the sort of London tech startups, you know, going from three people in Truman Brewery building to being a real global business. If you were to boil it down to one thing, like for this audience, for anyone who's striving to kind of follow in your footsteps in their own way, what, what would you advise them to do? What's the, is there a secret? Oh, that's a tough question. Is there a secret? You give your, what's your one word answer? One well, word answer? <laughs> <laughs> Matt's asked for a sentence, now you've sentence. boiled it down to a word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, one, I can boil it down. One thing, one thing, could be a word or a sentence. I'm going to go for a word, Matt, I'm going to go for a word. Team. Team. Well, you all initially had three people, so how does that work? Okay, oh, it's a, three really good, it's amazing a really people. <laughs> so, and, it, and, it, and it's But true. how do you turn three into 160? Well, so, I mean, ambition. Yeah, mm -hmm. is another thing because you can, you know, you can, y you set your sights. Yeah, you decide what your, you know, what a, a, an end goal looks like that you would be happy with. Yeah, and you can set your sights, you know, here or here or here. So honestly, a lot of it is really around that. And then it's just, you know, the usual work, blood, sweat and tears. I have to share a story. I remember when, uh, when David Cameron launched uh, Tech City uh, on Brick Lane, a few years ago, I think it was 2010, uh, I had a chat with Sarah and, and uh, I said, there's something going on, do you know where it is? And so we figured out where it was. I, I actually got myself invited, but you didn't get invited, so you guys were stuck outside uh, and, and they managed to, uh, basically they held a, an impromptu photo op with, uh, with unruly um, pillows, cushions, uh, and, and YouTube and Twitter, so you're basically supporting the ecosystem of social sharing, which was very nice, and you managed to get yourself uh, some, some media coverage as a result. Uh, but then, of course, when George Osborne launched the Future 50 program last year or thereabouts, where did he do it? At Unruly's offices in East London, which is incredible. So how did you, again, insinuate, go from being on the outside to the inside? That was a great day, by the way, uh, and I, I would always I would say uh, imagination trumps technology um, and, and also trumps budget. So we, you can have all the money in the world to do advertising, but actually that one little stunt that we did, which was just based on a bit of chutzpah uh, and having a dozen people with cushions stood outside the event, meant that all the great and the good of the tech scene were coming out and half of them were looking at us and going, unruly, 
are they sponsoring this event? Uh, and then the other half were coming out and saying, I'm oh, really, are they picketing this event? <laughs> so it was really, really fun. Uh, and how do we go from, how do we go from that to, uh, to George Osborne coming? Well, I mean, you partly answered the question. I mean, having the Hutzpah to do that in the first place. So, you know, we made actually, you know, as well as making Sky News that evening, we actually, you know, made some good contacts with, with journalists. And you just, again, you know, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Um, it, but it, I mean, going from the outside to the inside there is not an accident. Um, as we have grown, um, you know, we've been very deliberate um, in terms of um, trying to, you know, partner with and have an impact on the wider um, ecosystem, which isn't to say it's, um, you know, just sort of naked ulterior motives because if it was just that I don't think what we do would have the kind of you know wouldn't have any authenticity wouldn't have any gravitas behind it um, you know the the whole you know UK you know kind of tech scene that's evolved over the last five to ten years um, we've always been you know very um, you know ardent and involved um, supporters right. of because we think you know it's great for the micro area it's great for London it's it's great for the UK and it's a way in which you can have an impact on the world yeah. that's you know above and beyond just the impact of the staff that you're employing but how do you figure out how to run a global business when you've been running a successful London business because you know what, t you're in ten countries now. You've got thirteen. Uh, no, no, that's that's substantially different from what you were doing two years ago. It's a really good point, uh, and scaling up into different territories um, has been and remains the greatest challenge, I would say, uh, on, on in several ways. So communication becomes incredibly important uh, and much more difficult when you're communicating across time zones. Um, so you develop practices and processes that enable communication uh, easily across different offices. Uh, we communicate compulsively. We call it extreme communication. Um, our developers practice uh, a development methodology called extreme programming. Uh, and when we, com when we communicate, it has to be extreme. So some people would come into our, come into our room and go, whoa, you guys talk a lot. Um, but we need to, to make sure that everybody in the US and in our Singapore office and in San Francisco and in Norway uh, knows what's going on. So even, even if you over communicate, you still get people saying, oh, you don't tell us enough, you don't tell us what's going on. Right. You, you, I mean, I think it's one of the things that, one of the lessons that we've learnt is you, you, it, you actually can't over communicate. You're never communicating enough within a business. Mm -hmm. And then as well as communicating um, what's going on, it's about sharing best practices um, and making sure that we have consistency of delivery uh, across the whole company. Uh, and that's another, uh, you know, another area that we take really seriously, but that doesn't just come naturally. We have annual, f uh, what we call Unruly Fest, where everybody comes together for training. We do a lot of travel. And our travel bill is huge because uh, we put a lot of time and effort and resources into sending our best people across all our different offices so that we're sharing best practices. I mean, a lot of the challenge is just scale, whether you're geographically distributed or not. If you've ever worked in a large organisation, an organisation large enough to have different floors or buildings on different sides, sites, you have exactly the same problem and you need to solve it by exactly the same sorts of mechanics. So, you know, Yeah, but it, you're not necessarily running it. I mean, I, I worked at Reuters and they had lots of different floors and lots of different offices, but I wasn't in charge. I mean, you're in charge, you're the one setting the tone, so there's a, a certain level of complexity you have to manage. Let me ask you, uh, before we go, uh, just a couple of questions, um, before we go to the audience. The Future 50 program was set up to support um, fast-growing London startups. Uh, it's been described, I think, as a concierge service. To what extent has that actually helped you? And has that, has that made a meaningful impact on, on helping you to grow internationally? So where the Future 50 has been really helpful has been on quite a practical level, actually. Um, so help with visas. Uh, so we have a hotline, um, which means that we can, whenever we have any visa issues, and we have several, um, we have a number to call and they help us with problems and they fast track us uh, and make sure that that's not holding anything up. 
Uh, so that's been one, one area where it's been helpful. Net networking as well, they've yeah. been quite good yeah. with kind of meet, meet up events, you know, um, which both our um, chief financial officer and our chief people officer have, have benefited from. I mean, they do a very good job with very limited resources. Uh, I mean, Tech City, UK Tech City, I mean, it's about 10 people, right? right. But, but has it helped you, honestly? Because there's some skepticism, right? I mean, we, we all are part of this ecosystem. Has it made a real difference to you? It's difficult to attribute, but it's always difficult to attribute. So, for example, I would say, um, so Future 50 ran a fantastic um, course for us, just for us. Um, w soon after we launched, uh, they launched the program, they said, how can we help you? And we said, awareness, awareness in the US, we really need help. Um, we're struggling to get cut through in the US, there's so many companies. And they ran a, a special training session. We went along to that, other companies did too, we found that really helpful. Our PR presence in the US has dramatically improved in the past nine months. Can you directly attribute it to that or only attribute it to that? Probably not, but it's part of the learning process and I that mean, is helpful. Of course, of course it's not the difference between success and failure. I mean, it's never going to, you know, a bit of external support is never going to be the difference between success and failure. Mm. Um, but, you know, we're not, we're not proud and we'll take help wherever we can get it. You know, just yeah. doing this stuff is difficult, right? You know, if you can get visas done that you wouldn't have got done or get them done a bit faster, it is helpful because, you know, it's, um, I mean, it's true that it's probably not the difference between success and failure, but what is the difference between success and failure? It's, it's thousands and thousands of things and being able to do things a little bit better or a little bit faster. It's never one big thing. But you guys have also invested in, in helping to support a sort of community um, element to, t to London Tech with City and Rural University. Why is that something when you're growing a company and, and you have a family, um, why is that something that's meaningful to you as well? to do? I mean, why? Because well, basically, I mean, there may be people who are here who are not aware what City and Rural University is. So it's, it's, it's a free pop-up university based at your uh, offices here in East Exactly. Pop-up university designed for the next generation of entrepreneurs. One, because it's fun. Yeah. Uh, and we, we just, we enjoy learning new things. We enjoy having interesting events going on in the office. Uh, it's great for unrulies. Uh, it's just, it, it, it it, we enjoy it. It's great collaborating with Caroline and the team. Mario's awesome. We like working with good people and, and creating value. Uh, and then uh, you know, from a legacy perspective, we want to make a difference. Uh, and that's one reason for growing your business, because you can make a difference to your employees. Uh, but then doing something like City Emory University means you can make a difference in the broader community. And, it, and it's not bad from an awareness standpoint either. Yeah. You know, so you get all of these things kind of aligned. It's fun. It's part of our kind of, you know, company DNA. Um, it's great from a legacy standpoint, and it actually helps in a, you know, you know, real, you know, today's business concerns mm -hmm. in terms of you know what the level of unru of unruly's awareness is um, within the you know, London and, and UK um, ecosystem. So I've left uh, the last big question to, to the end, uh, and that is, you you guys, in addition to being co-founders of this company, are married. Uh, how exactly does that work? Because I know if you're like anyone else, I'm not sure if anyone didn't know that, but I, it took me about a year, or maybe a couple of years, to like, I think, I think they're going out. <laughs> <laughs> we had three children by this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little slow, what can I say? So, um, if you're like you know, any other couple, you'll have your moments where you don't necessarily totally agree with each other. How does that work when you, when you have those moments at home and then you come to work? <laughs> what to say to that? We're just, we're just, we're just always aligned. No, <laughs> I totally just, believe you. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing which is true, right? Um, as, as we've built out our exec team, so our senior management team now is 10 people, okay? Um, and to build a cohesive team where you've got people from all sorts of backgrounds with different personalities, different temperaments, it's actually quite hard, yeah? And, you, and to do that, if, if you want to run a really good exec team, you need people to be really honest. You need people to trust each other. Um, you know, you, you need all of that because you need to be able to have a robust debate. Um, you know, if, if you, you know, if you, a successful culture at the top is not everyone agreeing with you or being afraid to voice their um, opinion. And you know, I mean, this is this is this is my perspective. One of my perspectives on it. You're kind I of taking me away from the question. No, I'm not, because I'm <laughs> saying, I, the, uh, if, if anything, you know, I, I think we, in some ways, have better and, and more honest communications 
um, in our personal life now, just because I've learned and grown a bit as a person um, through having to you know, run and manage and lead um, a, 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 a management team. Okay, so that was Scott's answer. Sarah. <laughs> I'm clearly being very well managed. <laughs> no, what I would say is um, trust and alignment, as Scott was saying, um, is key. Uh, so I think having trust within a, um, an executive team is really important. And having co-founders you trust is really important. Um, and I think you know, Matt as well. So you've known Matt for a long time and worked with each other. Who's so the other co-founder? Who's the other co-founder? Who so I've known for 15 years, worked with for 15 years. Exactly. So, so we're almost married too. <laughs> <laughs> so the three of us so, uh, just have a great amount of trust and that really helps. But then it helps in practical, in pra there are practical ways in which it helps. So yeah. th thinking about picking up the kids um, or, to, or who's going to do the school run, um, those kind of questions are much e easier to answer. Those decisions are easier to make when you're working for the same company. Mm. So the thing you should know about me and Scott is we're complete workaholics um, and we, we love working and wherever we work and we've worked in many different jobs, we will work, t we'll work 18 hours a day because we just, whatever we're doing, we get really excited about it, really passionate and we'll go for it. So as a couple, it's really helpful to be working on the same project uh, because it, then you really are aligned and you're doing something that you feel passionate about together and that's really helpful. And then when you have to decide who's going to pick up the kids, it's quite straightforward conversation because... You just said Matt. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, Matt, he's got his own kids to pick up. <laughs> he's busy enough as it is. But we'll say, I'll say, oh, well, I've got a meeting here. And Scott will say, oh, okay, great. That's a really important meeting. You do that meeting, I'll pick up yeah, the kids. Yeah, you make a decision that is basically in the business best interest. So I know it seems really boring, but I'm honestly, I think if we were running different startups or working for different companies, we'd have much more conflicts coming into our domestic life than we use than we do. So you'd advise that? You'd advise people to who are married to start a company? Totally, totally. I mean if you know if you if you could stand each other for, for that you know that amount of time. There's the, it's funny, you, you get lots of sibling founders. Yeah. You actually get lots of um, people who are partners in life being partners in business. Yeah. But married partners actually get a lot less press than and a lot less talked about. Um, than, than kind of sibling founders, which honestly I think is a, you know, a, a reasonably subtle form of institutional kind of misogyny. It is interesting because there are a few, right? The, the founders of Edited, which is another local company, the founders of Bebo, the founders of Eventbrite. Yeah. There are yes. others. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 um, Zahambi, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Bowden, yeah. there's, there's a lot. Storm actually I found out the other day as well, yeah. Storm Watches. Um, yeah. The thing is, I wouldn't start a sports? company with my wife because I know that I just end up working for her. I hope you'll all join me in thanking Sarah and Scott for joining us today. Thank you.